House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones, oh shit, I forgot, uh, headphone warning, in this video I will be super excited as I've just finished my fifth cup of coffee and I always love to do that and then jump right into recording. So if you were listening to this video using headphones, I suggest you adjust the volume by about five decibels. House of the Dragon, the Game of Thrones prequel series, will actually feature a lot of the many great houses that play a role in the original series, and in this video I want to discuss how House Stark will likely be playing a role in this series. And mainly, who exactly is old man Cregane? We ain't said it's cool, man. But real quick, before we actually jump into the contents of this video, could you please do me a massive favor? And if you enjoy this, slap a like on it. Like goal's gonna be 420. Get it? <laughs> also, make sure you're subscribed. And then this is the most important part. If you're subscribed and you've already slapped a like, please make sure you have your notifications turned on. So that way you'll get an alert every single time I drop a video throughout this long night or the wait for more content from HBO, George R. Martin, and really any new news regarding Winds of Winter, this new prequel series, House of the Dragon. Long night. Now I do want to discuss Old Man Cregane. This isn't going to be a very long video, so let's get this out of the way first. One of the biggest things that I see buzzing in my comment section, and really in comment sections all across the internet on multiple different platforms about House of the Dragon, is the fact that the original Game of Thrones prequel series, The Long Night, was actually cancelled because of a uh, diversity issue. There were multiple different things that went into the cancelling of that prequel series, but a lot of the shit that you see being repeated online, a lot of the rhetoric that you see, is actually that they they tried to pander too much. They tried to make too many different characters, too many different races, and it didn't follow along with George's story, which is based on Anglo-Saxon English history. And George does include characters and individuals from all over the world in his world, but they're, they don't take the same sort of limelight that a lot of the other characters do in a lot of the great houses in Westeros, because believe it or not, Westeros is founded on England. There weren't a lot of black folks in England back in that time period. Now, don't get me wrong, there were, but George is an old white guy, and he's writing a about what the experience was like with his race throughout history. If you would like to see more of that into a show, I think, obviously I would, I think most people would, there's proper ways to do it. Now, there are certain characters that are sort of left ambiguous, whereas their race is maybe mentioned, maybe their skin tone or their complexion is more so left out, and that's the type of character that you want to cast as any race. There are certain characters that are related to other characters, and if you suddenly make that character black for one reason and change their origin, well that starts to manipulate the storyline too fucking much. It, it does this thing that's called pandering, and no one really likes, regardless of your race, to be pandered to. Like, obviously, the most important thing, I think all of the people involved with this show, and casting this show anyway, and writing it, need to care about the thing that needs to come first is not your race, not your sex, not your gender, whatever the fuck, none of that. It just, can you act? Are you good at acting? Do you look like, if this character is a main role, do you look like how this character is described. If their race, their skin complexion is left ambiguous, then maybe you can bend that a little bit. Maybe you could even cast the character as a male or a female as opposed to what they were in the books. You have to do it a certain way that doesn't seem like it's pandering. If they did something like make King Viserys a white guy and then made Rhaenyra uh, half half black and half white or something, that, th that wouldn't make sense because that's, that's not how it is in the books. All of the storyline and the plot involves the way certain characters look. Especially the main ones. So if you were going to do it, I think one of the ways to do it would be to change the race or the gender of a character that doesn't maybe have a starring role originally in the books or in the... I keep saying books. It's the princess and the queen, the rogue prince and a king's brother. But all of that information is compiled in Fire and Blood. And I try to release that or uh, link that down below in the description so you can go and read that and get all of that information. It doesn't just include the Dance of the Dragons, which is what this series is going to be based on. It actually covers a lot more fucking information like... Like Aegon's Conquest, the reign of Jaehaerys, and many, many other things that I think you should personally learn if you want to really have the upper hand when watching this series. But if you want to expand upon a character who doesn't really have that big of a role in the books or in the storyline of this book, so it really reads like a uh, like a history book, it's told from multiple uh, points of views of maesters, and you know some of them are the victors of the story, so it's the unreliable narrator. But if you want to expand upon the role, that's the way to do it. Or typecast a character or or sorry, change the role or gender of a character who is left up to description. Like,
like if you wanted to technically you could make nettles a dark-skinned black woman because she is mentioned to be valyrian but from her description of what george how george describes her in the books it's noted that nettie was a small brown-skinned girl with black hair and brown eyes the skinny girl had crooked teeth and a scarred nose according to gildalyn she could not be called pretty nettles was foul mouth filthy and fearless so from that description as well as from some of her interactions with damon who she i think takes on as a lover it, it wouldn't affect her at all really her character at all if you made her just a regular black woman she wouldn't necessarily have to be half black and half white like myself and be a similar complexion to me because it wouldn't affect the storyline at all george literally describes her as a small brown-skinned girl with black hair and brown eyes now the thing that you have to take into consideration is the fact that she's dragon seed she's half valyrian so there are people that would argue that technically that's not the right complexion to go with and i think that's sort of just grasping at straws if it were really more of an issue or maybe it's not really exclusively explained that every single valyrian that rode a dragon was had the traditional pale hair and, and purple eyes if that wasn't the case I, I mean i'm sort of what do you all think let me know down below in the comment section i think the best way to do it without considering it pandering is to change the role of a character that doesn't have as big of a role in the storyline and make that the race of that character whatever because they don't really have a description and then also sort of along those same lines is if the character's description is sort of ambiguous like nettles you can cast them in any sort of role and it won't matter their complexion in my opinion none of that shit matters i just want to see people who look like the main characters how they're described in the books and on top of all that the acting has to be it they have to be believable they can't just get the job because they're a certain race in my opinion that's fucking stupid but moving on to the purpose of this video and if anybody listening didn't want to hear that well then i apologize but i felt like it needed to be addressed or at least i needed to get my opinion out as uh, House of the Dragon will be out soon, and according to my sources, there's supposed to be some more cast members announced or confirmed publicly, rather, by the end of this week. Although they have been wrong in the past, and I've seen some people comment about how oh, your, your sources are legitimate, and yet you're pretending they are. Well, actually, I mentioned in almost every fucking video, I just don't do it in everyone because I hate repeating myself so much. You take this information with a grain of salt, the leaked information with a grain of salt, is the only purpose in me relaying it in these videos is to entertain you throughout the long fucking night. But Cregan Stark, old man Cregan. Now, it's interesting. At the beginning of the Dance of Dragons, he's not even that old. He's in his early 20s. The reason why he's called Old Man Kurgain is because in the Hour of the Wolf, which take place towards the uh, later seasons in this House of the Dragon series, uh, it takes place in the last like part of the Dance of Dragons. But he basically comes down to King's Landing and starts executing all the people that betrayed Rha Rhaenyra because she's the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Now, she's ultimately, I, I guess I'll say spoiler alert, Rhaenyra ends up going back to Dragonstone and after losing all of her children and once she gets there she's betrayed by one of her closer confidants and Aegon II her brother who she's been fighting for the crown the entire time has her fed to his dragon Sunfire. But getting back on track here Cregain Stark was actually born in 108 AC and he was the eldest son of Lord Rickon Stark and if that name sounds familiar that's because that's actually the name of one of Ned's sons and I believe it's either his father or his grandfather. A lot of the names in House Stark are a bit recycling but uh, according to the testimony of the Mushroom room, uh, Cregain Stark actually had a bastard sister known as Sarah Snow. Now, she has a bit of a relationship with one of Rhaenyra's sons, Jacaris Valerion, who at the time, Rhaenyra was queen, so technically Jacaris was the prince of Dragonstone, next in line for the Iron Throne. But according to Mushroom, who is a dwarf that will be playing a very similar role that Tyrion did in the main series, but according to his testimony, Sarah Snow and Jacaris Valerion, the prince of Dragonstone, slept together, and they resulted in something called the Pact of Ice and Fire. Now this is actually something that a lot of people believe is the reason why Rhaegar went out seeking a marriage from House Stark and obviously fell for Lyanna. Jon Snow's mother, but this is something that I'm sure they will heavily explore in this new series, and it will likely start out early. According to some of my sources, and remember, take that information with a grain of salt, but according to some of my sources, Cregain Stark will actually be brought in by the third episode. He'll play a slight role in the first seasons, and then when things really start to heat up, his role will be expanded upon a bit, and will play a bigger hand than just what he does according to the history books, which is really the most action that he sees is during the Hour of the Wolf, which is when Cregain actually held 
court at King's Landing for something like six days, and he acted in the name of the 11-year-old boy, King Aegon III Targaryen, who named him Hand of the King. Cregane only had something like 22 or 23 men arrested for the murder of Aegon II, which is interesting because he opposed Rhaenyra, but Cregane, being a typical Stark, followed the laws of the land, and even though these people that he executed betrayed Aegon II, uh, Cregane wasn't having none of that bullshit. And among those people was Lord Larys Strong and Chorus Valerion. Both of them will be heavy roles and major characters in this new series. Cregane served as hand for a day and presided over the trials and executions. Most of the accused, uh, led by Sir Perkin the Flea, agreed to join the Night's Watch, but Sir Giles Belgrave of the King's Guard and Larys the Clubfoot chose death. Cregane ended up marrying Alicene Blackwood in exchange for honoring Aegon III's pardon of Lord Corliss Valerion. Lord Stark resigned his hand the following day and ended up returning to the North, but many of the Northmen who had marched to King's Landing with him remained in the South. And the reason why George mentions this is because it's further showing you that a lot of the people, that even though they'll say, I'm blood of the, blood of the Northmen, I'm blood of the First Men, you're an Ang, you're an Andal, you came second or some bullshit. It, it's, just, it's just George further letting you know that the ties of the North reached the ties of the South and the blood of the first men and the Andals are actually mixed. And it goes even deeper, and it's interesting because the Northmen mainly say they have the blood of the first men, and so do the Wallops. So they're actually the same, and they built this massive wall to not only keep out uh, the others in any sort of evil, if you want to call it that, that exists in Westeros, but also the Wildlings themselves. I mean, that's why Jon Snow is executed. He tries to help these people because he realizes that they're the exact same as him. They were just born on the wrong side of the wall when the fucking thing was put up. Everybody's the same. We're all equal. The only thing that makes you different or better than someone else is what you decide to do with your life. I don't think you're given any special advantage because you're a certain race or because you're of a certain blood. At least that's the message that I get from George's stories. I don't know, I could be wrong. Bait me down in the comment section. Now with Cregane being so young, even though he's known as the old man to the north, this adds a lot, or tells you a lot about his character rather. The fact that he's known as old man lets you know that he lives a stern, hard life in the north. And obviously most of the individuals who grow up in that type of environment, a hard man. They're, they're the type of people to take no bullshit, which is why when he gets down to King's Landing and he's acting on behalf of Rhaenyra's son, because he was elected hand of the king by Aegon III, he still punishes people who betrayed Aegon II. He's following the laws. He puts honor and everything else above his own personal feelings of what he thinks may be right and what he thinks may be wrong. He goes by the law. And that sort of old school Stark mentality is what gives him that nickname. Now, one of the things or the first plot lines that we'll see Cregane Stark being involved Involved with involving his own house in Winterfell, and this will be big callbacks because Cregane is like a combination of Rob Stark, Jon Snow, and then also mostly Ned. So we'll be getting a lot of like callbacks to the early seasons of House Stark before you know Ned and Rob died. But anyway, one of the things that he deals with, and one of the storylines we're going to be seeing is that during his minority, like basically when he's crowned the uh, Lord of Winterfell at a young age, his uncle Bernard actually ruled the North as regent, and then when when Cregane turned 16 and came of age in 124 AC, Bernard was slow to surrender that power of the North over. And for those who are unaware, the North is actually one of the most strongest kingdoms in all of the Seven Kingdoms because really the North is the largest and it contains enough space to actually fit all of the other kingdoms inside of it. So anyone who's named the Lord of the North and Warden of the North controls an insane amount of power. And Cregane's uncle Bernard knew this and this is why he's hesitant to hand it over to Cregane because because that would mean that Bernard no longer rules over the largest kingdom. So, because he was slow to surrender his power, Bernard and Cregane's relationship grew strained, as the young Lord of Winterfell felt as though the limits imposed on him by his uncle uh, was preventing him from growing. And then finally, in 126 AC, Cregane rose up against his uncle and imprisoned Bernard and all three of his uncle's sons, taking the rule of the North into his own hands. Soon afterwards, he ended up marrying Lady Ara Nori, and they ended up, she ended up dying in 128 AC while giving birth to a son and heir whom Cregane named Rickon after his father. Now what's interesting about this is right around that time in 120 AC is right around the time, or sorry, 128 AC is right around the time at the beginning of the Dance of Dragons, which is likely a lot of the motivation behind why old man Cregane does a lot of the actions and the things that he does and why he's basically so harsh. He's going through a lot of shit, having lost his childhood best friend, Ara Nori, who he married. Now, I 
think that pretty much sums up who Cregane Stark's character is without going into too much detail, as obviously this video would be like 35 minutes long, and I just dropped one of those yesterday. Uh, Alright, I want to thank you all so, so much for watching. If you could please uh, slap a like on this video. The like goal is going to be 420. <laughs> also, make sure you're subscribed, and then it's the most important part. If you've done those two things, make sure you have your notifications turned on, so that way you'll get an alert every single time I drop a video throughout this long night. Super special shout out to every single member of my Patreon family, who you see listed right here. If you all watching are interested in joining, check out the links that one down below in the description, or one of the links that's popped off during this video. I want to thank you all again so, so much for watching. My name is Mark, and this has been Zerons. <clears throat> Review.